Hi, Active History is pleased to present a recording of Commemorations in the National Capital Region, Evolution and Finance. This roundtable was chaired by Eve Frenet and was held as part of the Canadian Historical Association annual meeting. You can find recordings of other talks at activehistory.ca. Bonsoir, je m'appelle Yves Frenet, je suis le président sortant et très sortant de, du comité des interventions publiques euh, à la Société historique du Canada et j'ai l'honneur de, de présider cette séance ce soir intitulée Commémoration dans la région de la capitale nationale, Evolution et Constant, Commémoration de la National Capital Region, Evolution and Finding. Euh, le conseil d'administration de la Société historique a pensé euh, il y a quelques mois déjà que ce serait une bonne idée. De, de profiter du passage du congrès de la société à Ottawa pour organiser cette, euh, cette table ronde. Euh, parce que peut-être plus qu'auparavant, euh, la commémoration, les commémorations des monuments euh, dans la région internationale ont suscité l'intérêt du public. So we decided to uh, organize uh, an event and uh, We, we are very happy and very happy to welcome the four people who will, will reflect uh, on the situation, uh, will reflect the tour. Um, and I will, je, je vais vous présenter uh, dans l'ordre où ils vont faire des présentations. The way will work, each of them will do a uh, 10 minute presentation. Then uh, I'm going to ask them questions coming from their presentation, we will discuss. Uh, among each other, and then it would be, uh, it would be, the uh, uh, salle pourra uh, réagir. Alors, le premier intervenant va être uh, Alain Roy. Alain Roy va avoir complété une maîtrise en histoire uh, à Laval en 95. Uh, une maîtrise qui portait sur la construction du lieu Québec en tant que ville de mémoire nationale. Il s'est spécialisé dans les phénomènes de mémoire et de patrimoine. Je ne ferai pas la liste des rapports et des dans ce domaine, il a été, euh, euh, avant d'émigrer dans la région de la capitale nationale, il a été un intervenant majeur dans le monde, dans le, sur l'étude de la mémoire et euh, du patrimoine dans la ville de Québec et plus généralement au Québec. Euh, il s'est intéressé au patrimoine, à la mémoire, à la francophonie, ainsi qu'au patrimoine d'hier. Euh, il a publié de nombreux articles dans le cadre d'un vaste projet franco-québécois. Québécois sur les lieux de mémoire en Nouvelle-France. Il a assumé la co-direction d'un volume. Euh, actuellement, Alain euh, est à l'envoi de la Bibliothèque et Archives Canada. Euh, donc, euh, les opinions qu'il va nous présenter aujourd'hui, ses réflexions, n'engagent que lui, bien sûr, et n'engagent pas la Bibliothèque et Archives Canada. Uh, the second person who is going to speak will be uh, Alan Gordon, who is a professor of history at the University of Guelph the editor of the Urban History Review. Uh, Alan holds degrees from Queen's University and the University of Toronto, and he has published extensively on historical commemorations and the public uses of history. He's the author of two books, Making Public Past, The Contested Terrain of Montreal's Public Memory, that has become a classic in the field of uh, uh, the politics of memory. And uh, the hero and the historian, historiography and the uses of Jean Cartier en 2010, uh, as well as the third book on the rise of living history museums in Canada that is currently in production and should be uh, to see the light of day in, uh, in the spring of 2016. Notre troisième intervenant sera Nadine Bloomer, qui uh, qui est docteur en sociologie de l'Université de Toronto, qui est présentement, euh, qui est présentement stagiaire postdoctorale à l'Université Concordia. She is affiliated, where she is affiliated with the Center for Ethnographic Research and Exhibition in the aftermath of violence. She is conducting a research on the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and the Memorial Landscape in Ottawa. She has a forthcoming article in the Review of Education, Pedagogy and Cultural Studies. And uh, in 
in this article and in our previous research and commemoration of the Roman Holocaust, uh, Nadine studies sites of cultural production such as museums, monuments, heritage tourism, in order to understand why societies remember some histories of violence while ignoring others. She was previously a research fellow uh, at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington when she started a book called Disentangling Hierarchies of Victimhood, How Germany Commemorates the Nazi Genocide of the Roma. Et, finalement, David Aiken, who is a Germany Award journalist who has spent the last decade covering federal politics uh, from Parliament Hill. Prior to that, uh, he spent uh, more than a decade covering technology and internet issues. Today is the Parliamentary Bureau Chief uh, for some media, but he worked for many other publications and, uh, uh, and media outlets. Uh, he has reported uh, around the world, and uh, he will, he is now, I guess, yeah, he is now covering his uh, fifth federal election campaign. Uh, David was born in Montreal. He studied history at the University of Wales. Then, as he writes, uh, he likely would have gone to complete postgraduate studies in history, but for the excitement of front page story that his first paper, the twice a week orange will banner. <laughs> so, encore une fois, merci aux quatre, euh, aux quatre intervenants d'être ici. Et je vais passer la parole d'abord à Alain Roy et je vais vous demander de, je vais vous demander tous les quatre de respecter le. Donc, merci pour ta gentille présentation. Euh, je veux juste euh, rappeler, euh, avant de commencer, euh, trois choses. Effectivement, je parle en mon nom personnel, moi en tant qu'employé euh, de BAC. Euh, deuxièmement, je suis, malgré moi, en fait, dans cette position fonctionnaire du gouvernement fédéral et donc euh, je ne commenterai pas la discussion sur les monuments, sur le monument du communisme. Vous comprendrez très bien. Et troisièmement, ma présentation va être en français, mais je vais répondre ou je peux traduire euh, s'il y a des questions euh, dans les deux langues, il n'y a aucun problème. Alors, euh, ce que je vais essayer de vous faire, en fait, c'est un peu un tableau d'ensemble euh, du phénomène de la commémoration dans la région de la capitale nationale. Parce que, parce que ça manque, en fait, on n'a pas cette, 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 cette perspective-là. Alors, euh, j'ai commencé par euh, cette présentation-là, donc je vais vous donner un peu l'ampleur du phénomène commémoratif et un certain nombre, en fait, de traits qui me semblent d'intérêt pour la discussion. Alors, euh, <coughs> au total, euh, d'après mes recherches, bon, bon, actuellement, j'ai cumulé, en fait, 193 monuments et plaques qui se situent dans la région de la capitale nationale. En fait, il y a 79 monuments comme tels et euh, des plaques de la Commission des lieux de la Monument historique du Canada, il y en a 55. J'ai fait un certain nombre, mais je n'ai pas retenu pour mon étude de approfondie parce que je m'en être donné soit sur le moment de la commémoration, c'est-à-dire quand ils ont été appliqués ou quand ils ont été, à quel endroit ils se situent. Alors, euh, si on prend les monuments, en fait, ce qui est d'abord fascinant, c'est qu'on pense en général que les monuments, c'est un phénomène du 19e siècle, mais en réalité, c'est vraiment un phénomène du 21e siècle. En fait, 29 des monuments, en fait, des 79 monuments, donc 23 sur 79, ont été érigés après dans 2000. Et euh, plus de la moitié, en fait, à partir des années 80. Si on y va rapidement, en fait, en divisant ça par période, avant 1920, en fait, on a 18 des monuments, 14 monuments, c'est-à-dire, c'est ça, 14, dont 8 sur la colline. Euh, donc, il y a une concentration géographique, il y a une concentration aussi des promoteurs, où c'est l'État, donc 86 des monuments avant 1920 sont des monuments euh, qui ont été soit sous la responsabilité de la, des travaux publics ou maintenant de la CCR. La période de 1920 à 1960, elle, c'est la plus faible, en fait, c'est celle où on a le moins. Il y a seulement 16, 13 monuments, ou 16 du total, et on aperçoit un phénomène de dispersion qui commence. C'est-à-dire que là, euh, il y en a quelques-unes au, au centre-ville de Gatineau. Mais encore là, c'est l'État qui, qui, qui a un rôle majeur pour 75 des monuments. De 60 à 2000, en fait, il y a 35 
Mais là, c'est vraiment intéressant parce qu'il y a vraiment une dispersion encore plus large, c'est-à-dire que c'est plus seulement dans les centres-villes, mais c'est aussi un peu à dans les périphéries. Et les villes vont on jouer un rôle plus marqué, c'est-à-dire qu'à cette époque-là, donc en 1960 et 2000, 42 des monuments, c'est des monuments donc, sous la responsabilité soit de la ville d'Ottawa ou de la ville de Tétis. La période plus récente, elle, est vraiment marquée par un retour, un retour de l'État, donc euh, 29 là, au total, donc euh, 30, euh, 47 par l'État, surtout la CCM, en fait, qui est 11 des, des 23 monuments, et euh, aussi le retour sur le centre-ville d'Ottawa autour de la ville. Donc, il y a comme un phénomène, si on veut, d'expansion, un phénomène de reconcentration qui est intéressant. Si on compare les plaques, par exemple, la commission des vieux monuments historiques, qui est un autre phénomène, euh, cette addition va être plus tardive et va donc euh, commencer, euh, et va être surtout marquée par une, euh, une présence plus élargie euh, dans, le centre, dans le centre du territoire. Maintenant, euh, si on regarde l'ensemble de ces monuments-là, donc je vais me concentrer sur les 79 monuments. En fait, la commémoration, si on apprend comme un phénomène, il y a cinq caractéristiques, en fait, de débat social autour de, de, des monuments. Le premier, c'est la question du langage, ou son expression formelle. Le deuxième, c'est le programme, ce qui doit être commémoré. Le troisième aspect, c'est la localisation, en fait, où on valorise cette commémoration-là et la participation aussi dans le processus, donc comment on engage la société civile ou les experts. Un cinquième trait que j'aimerais aborder, c'est la recherche euh, sur la commémoration dans la région. Alors, j'ai huit constats que je vais partager avec vous. Euh, le premier, bon, si on le voit par grand domaine, l'expression formelle. L'expression formelle, en termes donc, comment la, euh, il y a une constante là-dessus, c'est que depuis le début, depuis, en fait, le monument de quartier en 1885, c'est sous la responsabilité d'un comité consultatif. Donc, il y a une reconnaissance, généralement, que l'expression formelle ne peut être jugée par des pairs. Ça, c'est assez généralisé, bien qu'il y ait eu des variations dans la forme et la supervision des comités consultatifs. En général, aussi, l'expression formelle n'est pas l'objet de débat, sauf, par exemple, dans le cas du scout ou des monuments, euh, entre autres, à Arthur et euh, Bennett en 1966, qui n'ont pas, euh, pas été complétés. Donc, expression formelle. Le programme, euh, j'essaie de... Le programme, il y a trois, trois éléments de programme qui me semblent intéressants à considérer. Le premier, c'est que la, la commémoration dans la région de la capitale n'est pas seulement à destination de consommation canadienne, mais à destination de consommation internationale. Le meilleur exemple de ça, c'est le monument de de la Fontaine en 1906, parce que ce monument-là est créé, et quand euh, Lord Grey en parle, il dit c'est un modèle qu'on veut développer pour l'Afrique du Sud, qui est en processus de réconciliation. Donc, il y a un élément de consommation internationale. Le monument de Laurier, aussi, que, en 1927, se passe dans une tournée de l'Empire. En fait, il y a toujours cette dimension impériale-là qui se situe euh, dans, la, dans la, la discussion. Deuxièmement, deuxième élément du programme, c'est que la mise en place d'un programme commémoratif global est tiraillée entre une volonté de cohérence et des volontés politiques immédiates. C'est-à-dire, ce qu'on va commémorer, c'est comment ça se structure. Au départ, c'était vraiment comme un, un phénomène, si on veut, ad hoc, suite au décès, par exemple, de quartier McDonald's. Puis après ça, on a voulu contrebalancer avec les libéraux Mackie et Brown. Après ça, donc, il, il a commencé à se construire un, un programme qui était centré sur les grands hommes, la royauté, l'Empire, les corps fondateurs, les premiers ministres, les fonctionnaires, deux, mais à la périphérie de la colline et la rupture qui apparaît en 2000 avec les femmes sur des personnes, c'est-à-dire que ce n'est pas des personnes, mais c'est des personnes dans le sens plus symbolique. Alors, euh, bien entendu, puis ce qui va arriver, c'est que dans les années 2000, là, on va chercher, à partir des années 80, 1980 et 2000, on va chercher à développer un programme commémoratif cohérent, mais euh, en fait, donc, euh, et ça c'est le, le plan stratégique de 2006, qui dit, on a besoin de développer des thèmes, on va essayer de développer ça. 
Mais euh, en fait, il y a une difficulté de mettre en place ce programme-là, qui est celui des volontés politiques euh, quotidiennes. Le document de 1988 de la Commission du capital national, les révélateurs à cet égard, il dit euh, « Les procédés qui régissent la sélection et l'installation des, moments, des monuments commémoratifs de la capitale sont, dans la plupart des, des cas, des moyens politiques pour le résultat d'un programme. Bien qu'à première vue, il paraisse s'agir d'un geste impulsif, manquant de vision pour une question de cette importance, il reflète peut-être mieux l'esprit de commémoration en tant qu'expression d'une volonté politique et de valeur publique en évolution. Bien entendu, on a là un texte qui dit, parce que le mandat de cette étude-là est de dire qu'on ne s'adresse pas au programme. Troisième élément du programme, le fantasme de l'éternité est toujours confronté à la perte de sens. Le fantasme de l'éternité, c'est de croire que parce que c'est dans la pierre, le sens va être là pour toujours. Mais en, en réalité, ce n'est pas le cas. On a, par exemple, le meilleur exemple, c'est le monument Harper, euh, pas le premier ministre, mais le... <rire> le jour, en jour, enfin, euh, le scout à Nishinabe, ou le, le monument... La, la révolte du Nord-Ouest, qui aujourd'hui ne serait sûrement pas est, est conçue de la même manière. Alors, on peut tirer trois constats par rapport au euh, programme euh, à la question du fantasme. Euh, le fantasme survient surtout lorsque c'est décidé sur l'impulsion du moment, c'est-à-dire après quelques jours après la décision, on veut commémorer quelque chose en pensant que la signification, elle, va faire durer. On peut aussi penser que le monument seulement ne peut pas porter l'imitation de mémoire. Parce qu'on peut, quand on fait un monument, on pense que ça va supporter un changement de culture. Mais le monument seul ne peut porter ces mutations-là parce que pour qu'il vive dans la mémoire, il y a une nécessité de réinjecter du sens, que ce soit par la lecture, la réinterprétation, ou en ce qu'on appelle l'effet de réverbération. Ça dit quand on... okay. Euh, la localisation, ça va toujours être un élément, là, des, des trois autres euh, constats. La localisation, c'est une source de débat continu depuis le début. Et enfin, c'est, euh, il y a des plans, mais bon, ça va toujours rester difficile. Euh, la participation, c'est le sixième constat. La poussée vers la démocratisation exige un engagement de plus en, de plus, en plus grand dans le processus. Au début, on dit que ce n'est pas le cas, mais dès 2007, on dit que là, ce qui est critique, en fait, c'est la, c'est la participation des citoyens. Et ça, c'est un document de la CCN. Donc, le, la seule chose sur laquelle tous les Canadiens consultés sans s'entendre est qu'ils préféraient choisir les sujets comme le motif représentés dans la capitale plutôt que de se les faire imposer. C'est pas moi qui le dis. Et euh, Osborne et Osborne ont aussi été dans le même sens. Les deux dernières conclusions, deux derniers constats sont à propos de la recherche. La première, c'est qu'on est dans une, une recherche en quête de synthèse. On peut dire qu'il y a eu plusieurs tentatives d'appréhension par des thèses de maîtrise et de doctorat du phénomène global. En fait, il y en a au moins quatre. Et euh, quelques essais globaux, on pourrait penser à la série de Ottawa Citizen, Our Stories in Stone, mais il n'y a pas eu vraiment de l'appréhension cohérente de l'ensemble du phénomène. Euh, certains monuments, par contre, ont soulevé davantage d'intérêt, particulièrement le mémorial de Galles, le monument Champlain, le médecin de la paix et la colline parlementaire. Il me reste une, un autre constat qui peut-être va être important, qui va sûrement t'intéresser, c'est qu'il y a un an de mort de l'histoire pour moi, ce sont les années 20 et la construction du dentiste canadien. Parce qu'en en fait, beaucoup de la question identitaire canadienne, elle va se développer dans les années 20, en fait, euh, autour de, autour de Mackenzie mais autour aussi de la communauté historienne. Et cette période-là, elle est vraiment marquante dans l'histoire culturelle canadienne, et pourtant, euh, elle souffre d'anémie de d'études, on pourrait dire. Voilà. Alan Gorman. Merci. Je suis désolé que mon français est un peu trop vieux de parler en, en français. Je vais commencer mon parler en anglais, mais je suis heureux de ne pas comprendre les questions. Nous parlons aujourd'hui de la commémoration de la National Capital. Un peu dans le contexte de la capital de la ville. Les capitales de la ville jouent un rôle important dans toute nation, pour les raisons obvieuses de être le siège de la gouvernement et le centre de pouvoir politique, des lieux où les gouvernements. Uh, 
provide administrative and legal functions, and centralize control of the institutions of order, and in turn control the territories of the state. But they also serve as symbolic or commemorative spaces. They're typically where the country turns to see its history and its ambitions as a nation reflected back at them. Uh, and they house not only national institutions, but also many of the nation's uh, symbolic resources. And it's from these symbolic resources, it's uh, cities' commemorations, through institutional buildings, monuments, public plazas, bridges, grand boulevards, that we get the special feel of each individual capital city. In other words, they're more than just local architecture and local memorials. Capitals are, by definition, national cities. In other words, there's an accumulation of cultural capital in capital cities beyond what their local populations would produce. As national commemorative resources are redistributed to the center to create a space that means something for the nation as a whole. They create a landscape or a townscape, if you will, a cityscape of commemoration that's meant to reflect the nation back to itself, or at the very least, what some people want to enshrine as the patriotic or national values of the nation. But we need to remember there's more than one model of how a capital should look. In Canada, we tend to compare ourselves to the United States, so Ottawa versus Washington, D.C. But that's not a good comparison. Washington was a planned capital city on a much grander scale than Ottawa. Uh, the U.S. is a much larger, far more powerful country than Canada. And just the scale of something like Washington's National Mall, which is two miles long and a third of a mile wide, would look ridiculous in Ottawa Gap. <laughs> Moreover, our political institutions don't lend themselves to the division of branches of government that you see in the layout of Washington, D.C., with the Capitol building housing Congress of one end of Pennsylvania Avenue and the White House and the other. The two of the questions we were asked to consider uh, for this round table were one, how does Ottawa Gap most stand out in the North American commemorative landscape? And two, <coughs> how does Ottawa Gap most stand out in the national capital commemorative landscape around the world? And I'm not sure these are fair questions. Comparisons are difficult to make, even if Wilfrid Laurier once promised to turn Ottawa into the Washington of the North. Globally, Ottawa doesn't really compare to Paris, to Buenos Aires, even to Mexico City, or the other major capitals when it comes to the scale of its monuments and its grand boulevards or commemorative townscapes. It isn't fair to compare Ottawa to planned capitals like Canberra, or Brasilia, or New Delhi, or Islamabad, because they were laid out to become ceremonial and commemorative townscapes right from the start. London, England, you might say, is similar to Ottawa in that its commemorative spaces were not pre-planned. Even after the Great Fire of 1666, Londoners resisted attempts to build a planned capital city, and its commemorative spaces developed gradually over time. But obviously the size, scale, scope, length of history between the two makes that comparison seem a little preposterous. To be honest, one of the world capital cities that strikes me as similar to Ottawa is Montevideo in Uruguay. Not because they look anything alike, because they don't. They don't look a thing alike in architecture, in urban design, even the people on the streets. But they are both capital cities about the same size who lack grand vistas and obvious focal points. In both cities, you find monuments dominating prominent public squares, but once you walk past them, you disappear again into the city. And it could be virtually any city. You never really get the sense that you're in a capital city. But even that comparison doesn't quite work. Not just because these are totally different places with totally different cultures and histories, but because Ottawa Gatineau actually does have a commemorative precinct and a focal point, although the focus is often kind of blurry. Within this area is where people around Canada expect to see the values of the nation as a whole expressed. Now, it's hard to draw a direct or definitive boundary around it, but the National Capital Commission's Confederation Boulevard scheme comes relatively close to that uh, commemorative precinct. We have within that area Parliament Hill with its cluster of statues, as I was just describing them, the National War Memorial, um, the PM Point, Peacekeeping Monument, and quote, important institutional buildings that commemorate them in their own ways. And as a historian who's interested in cities, and especially commemorations in cities, I find this very interesting how it came to be in Ottawa. <coughs> Ottawa, we know, was a lumber town when it was first selected by Queen Victoria to become the capital in 1857. There was already an existing town, and the function of the capital city had to be grafted on inside of it. But the government, the country, and the town were too young and too small in the years after Confederation for anyone to really think seriously about the commemorations. So the town just grew along existing lines. It was really only in the 20th century that people began to consider commemoration. Now, the English historian Eric Hosbaum has famously identified the period from 1870 to World War I as the era of mass producing traditions, including a surge in the building of national monuments and planning commemorations. 
There's a running joke among Canadian historians that anything that happens in Britain or the United States will happen in Canada but 20 years later. And in Canada, that mass producing traditions or commemoration period does run from 1890 to about World War II, getting that 20 year gap, with the exception of the 21st century, as Alan has just uh, described it. Now, first of all, the Parliament buildings distinguished Ottawa from other Canadian towns. It was, it was and its layout reflected it, a commercial town. The first commemoration was, I believe, the George Etienne Cartier Monument on Parliament Hill, inaugurated in 1885, and the others on the hill that soon followed. But the first thoughts about planning for a capital city really only began around the First World War. And planning was interrupted by both the First and the Second World Wars. Now, of course, again, we have to note there's always a distinction, sometimes it's self blurry, between planning for a city and planning for a capital. The first is about traffic, sanitation, livability. The second is about symbolism. Ottawa's most significant commemoration emerged from this context of trying to plan symbolic spaces within the existing urban environment a process that produced the National War Memorial and Confederation Square, as we call it today. And despite the efforts of Mackenzie King and its chief planner, Jacques Rebert, Ottawa didn't produce a national mall or shops at these eight. So what function, then, did commemorations in cal- serving capital cities, with particular reference to Ottawa? To answer that, again, we have to distinguish different types of commemoration. There are living commemorations, such as the annual Canada Day celebrations on the hill. And there are monumental commemorations, structures and spaces designed to become sites of memory, such as monuments and public squares. These are sites dedicated and decorated in ways that are meant to evoke memories and invoke patriotism. These are places that give the city its symbols. Sometimes these combine, such as a remembrance day, and that combination gives the ceremonial spaces increased life. So let's consider first monuments, partly because I'm probably already running out of time. Monuments serve a number of purposes. They're memorials, and they perpetuate memories. They aid civic education by recognizing great leaders and accomplishments. And they're intended to direct our values. They are meant to be forever unchanging. Again, I refer back to that and the phantasm to cut off that you're talking about. Monuments are meant to be forever unchanging, perpetuating a timeless, as timeless the values of the people that built them. And this, I think, in part, is the reason for the unrest over the current commemorative plans in Ottawa Gatineau, especially the monuments of the victims of, of communism. It's particularly upsetting for many people. Some oppose the design and the size, and to my mind, quite rightly. Some oppose the site or the local locale for the monument, and again, to my mind, quite rightly. And some people oppose its message, saying, you know, basically, where is the monument to the victims of capitalism? All of this is balanced it out. Of course, as some have asked. Or should we have other monuments in our national capital, the things that didn't happen in Canada? Many people simply see this as a monstrously large, non law universal expression of a particular set of values, not of national values. It doesn't reflect Canada so much as something else to their mind. But this is also troubling because it follows from a commemorative pattern that many people have identified for current government as striking, an attempt to rebrand Canada's values. There's been a celebration of the military, for instance, beginning with the Valens Memorial, a curious sort of constituency politics selection of military figures from around Canada's past and around Canada's geography, placed near the National War Memorial, as well as the Harper government's first commemorative acts in the capital. It was inaugurated six months after Stephen Harper first became Prime Minister. More recently, we see the War of 1812 Memorial on Parliament Hill, which was part of an enormous push by the government to turn that war into something it never was. And there'll be more of these monuments to come. To these complaints, although I share them, I respond that commemorations are always political. That's their purpose. They're an attempt to shape values. If I can return again briefly to Uruguay, in one of the main squares of Montevideo, there's an enormous statue of General Jose Artigas, considered to be the founding father of the country of Uruguay. The monument dates from the late 19th century, but during the military dictatorship of the 1970s, the generals, the generals built a mausoleum for Artigas' remains beneath the monument in the hopes of linking their military <coughs> uh, to, the, to the, the image of the favorable founding father and founding general. But unfortunately, Artigas' speeches were all about freedom and liberty, so it kind of backfired on the government our military dictatorships whose entire purpose was to suppress freedom and liberty. But around the world, we can see this sort of use of commemorations elsewhere. Things like the French Revolution, even reordered time, changed the names of days and months, and so the calendar would coincide with the revolution, an idea that Khmer Rouge stole when, for their revolution in the 1970s. So the Soviet Union used commemorations of Lenin to support the Stalinist state that followed the Russian Revolution. And these uses of commemoration are also political ideology. 
That's for this reason that in unstable countries, warnings are often toppled when the regime changes. But even in stable democratic countries, partisanship plays a role in commemoration. It's just one example. The Ronald Reagan Legacy Project in the U.S. is an effort to, to name one significant landmark in each of the 50 U.S. states after the 40th president. The initiative is organized by Americans for Tax Reform, a conservative <laughs> lobby group that opposes any of all tax increases and I believe supports a flat tax. Here in Ottawa, all of the statutes of past prime ministers on Parliament Hill were commissioned and inaugurated when their party was in office, with the exception of Lester Pearson. Well, Bernie's government's responsible for that one. But other than that, liberal governments celebrated liberal prime ministers. Tory governments celebrated Tory prime ministers. It's more subtle, but partisanship still plays a role. Now, just by way of conclusion, because I don't really have one, I'm not arguing that we should accept partisanship and commemoration just because it's always happened. That's not my point. I'm not saying we throw our hands up and say, well, if they want to build it, that's fine, we'll build something else later. But I think understanding that partisanship and politics plays a role in commemoration, truly coming to grasp that concept, will help those who want to argue against it. And understanding the role in commemoration in capital cities in particular will help us to understand the reasons behind the arguments against certain monuments. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, even uh, as, as, as he mentioned, I, I once hoped to join this profession, but I got sidetracked. So of course, that's great to sort of pretend like I'm a history professor. At least a few minutes. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to rip a bit off what Ellen and Alan said. Um, I didn't know that we had sort of 79 monuments, is that so the Canadian Department of Canadian Heritage lists at its website 29 monuments. Uh, it's sort of, that's the official government, 29 monuments, nine of which uh, have been inaugurated or, or unveiled with this current prime minister. That's almost one third. And, uh, and think about this sort of through the, the Valence Memorial, uh, the Monument to Fallen Diplomats, that was a gift from the Republic of Turkey a couple of years ago, the Canadian Firefighters Memorial, Animals in War Dedication. Did you know that one was out there? Yes, of course. Royal Canadian Navy Monument, Defense of Hong Kong Monument, Hungarian Monument, Statue of John McRae, uh, in addition to the National Artillery Monument. You see the theme here. There, there, there isn't a uh, Women Are Persons Monument that the Harvard government's responsible for. They're all a kind of military. And so my interest as a political journalist, as I look at these, is to say, and I'll just start with the third point, yes, it's all political. So what is the point? What is the political objective that political journalists and you guys and uh, voters sort of ought to be aware of. And quite clearly, I think that the, the mission of the uh, Harper gang has been, uh, since day one, to sort of make them the default party at election time. And, uh, and of course, that's opposition to be the liberals were the default party. The liberals were in power, and then they'd be up a bit, and then they, we, we'd come back to them after we sat them on the bench. And of course, the Harper guys have been very successful. They've been decades in power now for almost a decade. And they like Canadians to think of themselves as the default party. And I'm going to veer a little bit, uh, just a bit. This, I think, became most evident when, uh, it was a couple of years ago, we had the big anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights, was it 40 or something like that, I think. And Bob Ray was then leading the, the Liberal Party, and, and Bob Ray and all the Liberals got up in the House of Commons and were indignant that uh, the government was not marking this significant anniversary. It's the Charter of Rights are crying out loud. How can we not be creating more monuments and doing all sorts of things? And for the conservatives, the Bill of Rights was a more important document to them. For liberals, uh, you know, Canadian history has an arc towards the Charter of Rights, and now we're post-Charter period. And that's that's liberal Canada history. It's all about the Charter of Rights. Conservatives, it's a whole bunch of different things. Uh, Bill of Rights had property rights, which is very important to conservatives. It's a conservative minded people. The Charter of Rights is absent on that big effect. I asked Tom O'Care the day that we were celebrating. I said, where are you, where are you guys on this one? Democrats who party without a history, really, until they get in government. Royal Proclamation was more significant for Tom Mulcair because it involved French, English, and First Nations, all sort of as equal people. That sort of started, that's interesting, because as we could see in the Democrats form government this fall, and they will now start to create monuments, and they will start to name buildings after leading lights, Tom Douglas, airports, and museums everywhere, uh, you're sure to see. Um, so I'm interested in, in, in how these parties remake Canada to sustain their political narrative. And, that's, and the Liberals have been fabulous at it. It's one of the reasons they've been, I think, so successful. 
Um, so let me just jump around a little bit here. Um, we're going to see some, I think we, we mentioned that this already, we're going to see some new monuments, uh, the National Holocaust Monument, the, the Communist Monument, the Bill Canada King and Building Trades Monument should be unveiled uh, this fall by the Harper government. But then we have some more monuments to our glorious war, making ability, uh, Afghanistan, a Victoria Cross Monument uh, is coming up uh, as well. Um, the uh, In terms of commemoration ceremonies, there's two live ones that happen every year that I think are worthy of more thought by me, more thought by perhaps uh, guys in your profession. And that is the Remembrance Day Ceremony at the National War Memorial. Uh, a decade ago, well maybe a little more than a decade ago, 12 or 15 years ago, uh, there might be four or 5,000 people, it wasn't a big event, Peter Mansbridge would not show up to it. Um, nowadays, these 60, 70, 80,000 people are coming to this thing. It's a very big deal. All three networks, four networks sometimes, broadcasted live in Mansbridge comes to Ottawa. This is the biggest commemoration event on the Hill. And of course, it's, a, it's marking and, 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 uh, and the achievements or, or, or whatever of our Korean War soldiers, our Second World War veterans, but obviously real live veterans from a very hot war in Afghanistan. Uh, that, that, to my mind, how that has changed is interesting, and I'm not sure what to make of it. They're also for the tourists, starting in a couple of weeks, or yeah, July 1st, I think, there's a show called Mosaica, which is when they, uh, they light up the center block and they broadcast, it's a 40 minute long, you know, the history of Canada in 40 minutes with lights and sound. It's kind of neat to watch. Kids like it a lot. Well, when the, when the Harper government took over the, the current version of Mosaica, a whole lot of Pierre Trudeau canoeing, signing the Charter of Rights, the Queen, a whole lot of Pierre Trudeau. And within about two years, that got pulled. And uh, there wasn't really a lot of Trudeau. A lot of board showed up. Uh, perhaps more than it deserved. But nonetheless, that, and it's been it changed one more time. Now, that's the Department of Canadian Heritage with the NCC putting that together in consultation. But this is, again, it's partisan politics. And it's the government of the day is trying to create a narrative for the tourists that reflects some of its values. Uh, and if it's got some values, what, what, what are the values that might sustain a conservative government? Paul Wells, my friend, and you've got to read his book about the long run prime minister, he has a long section in which he talks about the, the, the philosophy, political philosophy, perhaps, behind Stephen Harper and conservatives. Sort of a Burkean thing, where social cohesion is more important, social stability is more important, the group is more important than what you would think, sort of classical liberal philosophy, where it's, it's all about the triumph of the individual, the charter of rights and freedoms, that's uh, classic liberals. And that's why I think a lot of the audience we're seeing has to do with uh, promoting or uh, remembering works that preserve this social cohesion, this social stability. That would be uh, more important. Just to touch on some of the questions you asked us to look at, one of the starkest differences between this capital and the American capital for me is the American capital, is there any First World War monuments in the main major First World War monuments? No, because that wasn't much of a war for them. It's a big deal, that war for us, the center block, the, the peace tower. It's the most iconic, what does Ottawa stand for? That's a World War I monument. The National War Memorial, built, of course, uh, to honor the uh, First World War. Uh, that, to me, that's the biggest difference in the U.S. and Canada. It's World War One is a, the first World War, the Great War, is a real big uh, deal for us. John McRae, you know, we're, we're talking about that right now. Um, how does Ottawa get to stand out in the national commitment or landscape around the world? You ask this, <coughs> one answer to that, we have a long way to um, <laughs> I travel a lot with the Prime Minister, so he's been around the world. I, I'm in the back of his airplane, uh, wherever he goes. And wherever he goes, almost the first thing he does when he's visiting a national capital is he goes to a war memorial. He lays a wreath at a war memorial. That is almost the first thing he does. I've been with him twice to Hong Kong. We've been to the cemetery, the Saiwan, Saiwan Cemetery, that's where the Second World War uh, uh, folks are buried. He's done that twice. Uh, the only other uh, <coughs> cemetery he's done twice would be Denny. He's done that twice as well. He had the best speech I've ever seen him give at the 90th anniversary of the uh, a couple of years ago, because he really likes this stuff. He wrote it himself, he's really into it. But wherever we go, there's going to be that component in the official program. And interest interestingly, whenever someone comes here, we just had the Dutch royal family here a uh, whole other week, first thing they do when they come to Ottawa, you go to the war memorial and you lay a wreath. And that, again, just coming back to the whole idea that this is what we want to 
celebrate are these are the things that, that bind our nation to other nations is fighting for whatever it may be. Um, to, 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 what else do I want to just touch on here? Uh, no, that, that's about it. So, uh, so for the purpose of our discussion, you know, I hope you use me as a resource to talk about the intersection of politics, uh, how we're celebrating history, how we're not celebrating some kinds of history, and one of the things I hope to use to, to, to this discussion for is to then write about it and ask more of the new Democrats, of the liberals, and the conservatives, how they plan to try and achieve political ends by getting Canadians to think about their history, their monuments, et cetera, et cetera, differently. Hi, so I think um, that was actually a good uh, segue to my, uh, my uh, talk. Um, so two things I'd like to do uh, to shift things a little bit is to actually uh, step outside of the National Capital Region for a few minutes and to actually go westward to Winnipeg, um, where there's the newly opened uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and you can see a, a picture of it in the background over here. Um, and then in front of it, this is a picture I took, I believe it was November 2012, when the museum was still being built, so it's still a construction site, and this is one of the posters that was surrounding the museum, in which it says, uh, I don't know if you can see it, small there, and the conversation has begun. So in addition to going west uh, for the first part of my talk, I also want to think about the work, the politics, the meanings that are generated uh, by memorials as well as memorial museums such as this one that go beyond the concrete or the stone pillars of the actual actual structure. So just as a very quick uh, kind of research uh, biography that I can give you, is I started doing research on the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and I was interested primarily in the debates going on as to which histories were going to be included in the museum and which ones were being omitted and who was angry and who was feeling left out. And primarily I was looking at some of the um, Ukrainian community groups that were protesting the fact that the Stalinist-led uh, famine against the Ukrainians, uh, referred to sometimes as Holodomor, was not receiving as much attention as, as the Holocaust, the Nazi genocide of the Jews in the museum. Um, fast forward a few months, I then started to hear about these debates going on in Ottawa about the Victims of Communism Memorial, and at the same time there was a new, another new memorial going on victims of the Holocaust, and I was surprised or just interested in potential parallels between these. And I started to think about Canada as a, as a broad memorial landscape, not, not located only in Ottawa, but also with some, some arms to the west in this case. Um, and I was curious to know if any of the debates that were happening here were being replicated uh, in Ottawa. And interestingly, all of the debate has been focused on the, um, on the Victims of Communism Memorial, and not much is being said about the, the Holocaust Memorial. Um, <laughs> I shifted, I've shifted west, uh, and then the second thing, as I said, that I wanted to do is also to focus on the discourse, the conversation, the debate uh, that emerges from these physical structures, and I thought this signpost uh, was an interesting, both metaphorical and also literal, invitation to think about these, these debates and conversations. Um, and mainly, I'm going to give a couple of examples uh, when we, uh, in terms of protest, so conversation in the form of, of protest, grassroots protest. Uh, so so here's a more uh, complete uh, image of the, uh, of the CMHR, Canadian Museum of Human Rights, uh, upon opening. Um, just quick background, this was opened in Winnipeg, Manitoba, but this past September 2014, the first national museum to be opened outside of the national capital region. Uh, so again, an interesting link to, to Ottawa, but geographically separate from it. Um, and this project took more than 10 years to complete. Uh, one of the reasons is because there are many debates and conflicts between different community groups, the government, curators and developers in the museum in regard to this question of what's being included and what's being excluded. Um, one of the debates that has been going on has been with First Nations communities. Uh, there are a whole number of issues coming out of First Nations communities' protests of these museums, of this museum, but one thing, I, one community I want to focus on in particular is the Shoal Lake Number 40 First Nation. Uh, so this is a community of approximately 300 people uh, near Kenora on the provincial border between Manitoba and Ontario. Uh, and they're situated about 160 kilometers uh, east of Winnipeg. This is going to become relevant in just a minute. Um, so this community, this First Nations community, was artificially uh, transformed into an island back in 1919 when the city of Winnipeg uh, needed to build a viaduct 
uh, to get a clean water source. So this island was uh, at that point uh, artificially um, created. Um, and as a result, the people living on that island as the First uh, Nations community lost access to clean water, ironically enough, and have been uh, trying since then uh, to, to find a clean water source to get the government to provide that to them, as well as build uh, safe road access. Uh, they've been protesting for years, and you can change the slide. Uh, but in fact, uh, they've gotten the most media attention, I believe, in the past uh, year, uh, when they decided to align their protest with the opening of the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, uh, when they launched the Museum for Canadian Human Rights Violations. So clear parallel uh, playing on the name of, of the CMHR. Uh, and they launched their project um, about five days uh, before September 19th or 20th when the, when the CMHR in fact opened. And this emblem, this is the official emblem of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights Violations. Uh, you, see, you see the CMHR in one corner uh, connected very directly to Shoal Lake, uh, the island of Shoal Lake, you know, pipe, a pipeline that uh, literally sucks out the water. Um, so one of the major protests um, of the Shoal Lake community is not just to try to rally uh, for uh, safe, safe um, road access from the government as well as fresh water, but also to protest the museum directly because they feel that their ongoing human rights <coughs> violations are not being uh, respected and represented in the museum itself. And even more, um, uh, more offensively, uh, one of the main areas of the CMHR uh, is called the Garden of Contemplation. Uh, which has a whole, which celebrates water and has a whole bunch of uh, mini pools, and I mean, uh, obviously because Winnipeg's main water source comes from this uh, from this lake, the water used in those pools uh, to celebrate uh, the power, the contemplative power of water, comes from this community, and there's actually no reference anywhere in the museum to the fact that the water is being taken from there. Um, so this example. Um, this example is simply to show um, a form of uh, noise that's being generated uh, from the concrete structure of a national museum. Uh, it's giving additional momentum to a grassroots organization trying to protest uh, both the local, uh, federal, as well as um, national, uh, sorry, provincial governments um, for very specific things. Moving now back uh, east to Ottawa, the national capital region, um, I want to, uh, I, I recently found out about another analogous uh, protest group that was using an official, a planned official national monument uh, to put forward um, to protest, uh, to protest uh, against that. So this is the Facebook page of a, a group called Entrepreneurs du Coma. Uh, they're a collection of mostly Quebecois artists and intellectuals. Um, and um, they are quite offended, as many people seem to be, about the plans for Victims of Communism Memorial. And they got together and decided uh, to put forward a call for proposals for a, a monument, a memorial to uh, liberty. Um, and I'm going to just quickly read to you their, um, what it said on their uh, call for proposals. Uh, and this was, oh, here it is. So the call for proposal seeks to stimulate critical reflection around the Canadian Victims of Communism Memorial. The, the aim of monuments to the victims of liberty is to question the conservative government's ideological instrumentalization of the concept of liberty in the lead up to next year's federal elections. According to the Harper government, and I quote, Nazism, Marxist, Leninism, today, terrorism, they all have one thing in common. The destruction, the end of human liberty. End quote, and that's a quote from Stephen Harper, 2014. Um, faced with such gross historical confusions and ideological simpl simplifications, we pose the following questions. Are there victims of liberty? If so, who are they? Do totalitarian forms of liberty exist? What makes the Harper government's particular brand of Canadian freedom so distinctive? Can we make public the lapse between how such freedom is defined and how it is executed? So all of that is from the official call for proposals that this group uh, put forward uh, back last summer. And in September, the deadline for the call of proposals saw about 30, I think it was 28. 28 proposals were submitted, and they're planning a big um, exhibit this coming September in Gatineau in, a, in an art gallery, um, hoping to align to be close to the federal election as a way, and also probably the opening of the victims, uh, or the inauguration of the victims of communism memorial as planned. Um, so again, another example of noise that's generated around an official plan 
uh, an official monument and the, um, the protests that, that goes along with it. And finally, finally uh, my very modest attempt at also generating some public discussion, which unfortunately I, I really failed a little bit. This is an op-ed I wrote uh, last month. It was published in the Ottawa Citizen. Um, and the byline there is, uh, not the byline, but the, uh, the title um, kind of sums up what I'm trying to talk about today. Memorials are built out of public discussion and debate as much as they are out of concrete and stone. And my main point is that we may have um, some gripes with uh, these official places. What is the ideology behind it? What is the government trying to push forward? But I think there's so much value in the conversations being generated and the debates and the new ideas being put forward. And so I ask, uh, why is nobody saying anything about the Holocaust Memorial? And I'm not necessarily saying that we should not have this monument, but at least to spark some sort of debate, a national debate. It doesn't necessarily have to be quite as vicious as the victims of communism debate has been. Um, but to just start thinking through uh, how does this monument fit into the Harbor government's bigger project of commemoration, as uh, my fellow panelists have discussed here. Um, and what ideas are we, are we potentially missing out on by not having this discussion as well? I, I will leave off the that. Thank you. 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 Thank En 2009, euh, avec d'autres historiens, j'ai été invité à participer à, 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 à participer à un comité, euh, un comité consultatif euh, sur la commémoration dans la capitale nationale. It had been created by Mark Fitzmanson, who was at the time who is a historian, who was the director of uh, uh, public events at uh, public programmation at the uh, at the uh, National Capital. Now Mark is the head of the, the, the Capital National, the Commission of the Capital National. And the idea is that he wanted to have some expert advice, but it's interesting that the people that formed themselves in the committee, this new committee in 2009, were myself, uh, Mark, Mark Conrad from, the, from uh, New Brunswick, uh, and uh, 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 Leipzig. And it was Tom Simons, because Tom Simons is like the statesman of the commemoration in Canada, because Tom Simons was for many years uh, president of the, 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 the National uh, Commission, uh, Commission des Monuments, Lieu et Monuments National du Canada. And uh, we were, and then Jim Miller joined us, who is a leading from the West, who is a leading uh, Aboriginal historian. And uh, the idea was that. The National Commission wanted to get away from military history and political history to include themes. They said, this is why we were there. We were, uh, except for uh, Tom Simon, we were all uh, social historians. And, uh, but it was not so much a question of politics at the time in 2009. It came later. In 2009, finally, the process doesn't allow very much groups that have been, let's say, marginalized to participate because there is a question of money, there is a question of also, it's a, it's a complex process to bring forward uh, a file. So it will be very difficult for uh, uh, a group that doesn't have uh, much uh, social capital or much capital to, uh, to go forward. And this, this, this was the main reason why it has been, it has been a failure, but there was no... Uh, that there was no, not too many social uh, uh, social commemor commemorations of, uh, that deal with the social history. Alors, j'aimerais maintenant uh, repasser la parole au, uh, à nos panélistes. You see, you see really a continuous line rather than a big change that, you know, I think the general public and maybe some of us, we we think that with the Harper government, it's something completely that is quite new in the commemoration. So, do I okay. oversimplify by saying uh, that? Yes, in some way. Um, for sure, there's some continuity. For, for example, the question of 
uh, formal expression, some big, there were some, some stuff that were, you know, but that started in the 19th century, it still continues. But in fact, the main question for me, or the main changes is the, is in the process, in the fact that people are asking and the question of being part of the decision making process. This is the push for democracy. There was expert committee, but more and more, this was recognized by the National Capital Commission that there is a need to, to, uh, to have this as a, as a public discourse, but also get some consensus. And in fact, Osborne and Osborne mentioned it. It's a question of the value of the, the long, if you want a monument that is long lasting, it has to be built on some consensus. Now, nowadays, in fact, we have what we see is more like a polarized debate, but not really a real uh, debate for the, you know, it's something that you're for or against, and not really getting something that we, people will agree upon at the end of the process. So, in fact, the long life, this will fail in the long term because there won't be this large consensus between people that this is the right stuff. So, the, the push for democracy is, is there, and, and is also, it's all, something that is also always in the uh, progressing, in fact. Second point is also the policy game, and uh, it's, I refer back to what uh, David mentioned. In the name, it, it's interesting to see how the political parties played the commemoration game in the 90s, because at that time, and it was like Martin Luther King was there, and he wanted, you know, having this big show about Lovely and the Confederation place. But at that time, he wanted to move some monuments from, I, I think it's in Mackenzie, but he wanted to put Mackenzie on, on, on one end and Laurie at the other end. And he asked that to Megan. And Megan said, no, we, uh, I don't agree with that. So the plan for, for Mackenzie King was just scrapped because there was no, there was this consensus between the parties on the, on the, on the parliament here. So there's, I think, also this polarization is what we are seeing now. It's a bit different from what happened. So this is some, it's still the question of getting a more consensus, I think, now. Well, no, I would tend to concur. I mean, there's, there's that continuity that's resulting in the struggle to remind us of commemoration and how it can be done, but there have been moments of a consensus about sort of broad base and consensus about, about certain ideas. It's the kind of polarization we're seeing today, I don't think it is all that new. I think it's just returning again. In the same way that I think the conservative government is actually returning to the older style monument foundation, the older style commemoration, trying to build it around stone and bronze monuments rather than building it around community and, uh, involvement you know, or, or, or the kind of commemorative, uh, commemorative institutions like, like gardens, like parks, things like that, that are, that are more, um, the more daily use. And that's why I think it's a little bit interesting about this, this current way since about 2000, is this return to an older style, which is going with it, an older style of polarization that we see in the 19th century, not so much in the 20th century. In the 20th century, I think Canadians have generally built up a consensus about what needed to be commemorated. It was war, but that was because the war had touched so many people. The first thing, the first world war in particular, but also the second world war, following that. Recently, I think it's part to do with, with the way politics have gone, part of politics in particular. They have deliberately polarized our discussions. And when you do that, you're suspicious of everything that comes out of that, and that includes decisions to commemorate. So that's, as I said, there's a continuity, but there's also, um, there are also significant differences as well. David or Martin, would you have something to add? Well, I, I, one of the things I do, uh, part of my political work, is I, I try and track every time the government stands up and spends money. On uh, any given day, there's probably a press release that goes this way. Uh, MP so-and-so, on behalf of Minister so-and-so, is pleased to announce a check uh, for so much a month for whatever it is. And there's, all sorts of government programs. The budget is one thing. The government says, maybe in the budget, we're going to spend, let's say, uh, $25 million on, to give you an example, the New Horizons for Seniors projects. And that is a system where uh, if you have a seniors group in your community, you can apply to uh, Employment uh, Service Canada and get uh, up to $10,000 to pick up, to fix up your senior center. That's, so I track the actual checks when they show up, they've approved the project. 
there's been about, I'm right now, my database has about 6,000 such announcements since the last election. Um, again, this is all sorts of spending. One of the spending programs, you recall, uh, you know, we had this infrastructure spending to create jobs, the economic action plan. And there was a lot of announcements. I'm going to build a bridge, I'm going to build a, uh, fix up a rec center, fix up an arena. Well, Veterans Affairs got a whole pile of money to fix up cenotaphs. You may have seen this. And uh, this is right across the country. Not only fix up cenotaphs, uh, usually these are small check amounts, $1,000 a year, $8,000 a year, depending on where, where it's at. This is the national capital program, it seems to me, driven down to the grassroots. Bernard Lord, the former premier of Brunswick, uh, once said to me that uh, as a politician, he got a lot more political mileage for showing up at a senior cell or a senate with a thousand dollar check for whatever group than he did showing up to say, I'm going to build a $25 million overpass. More little checks are way more valuable to a politician on the stump. So I just, I just throw that out. And there's been new ones too. I just did some ATI work because I wanted to see the thinking behind the, the bureaucratic government thinking behind establishing new commemoration sites. Is anybody from Beaconsfield, Montreal, a chance? There's, there's one called Heroes Park. This is about a year and a half old. And it was a, uh, a military person who thought the idea would eat something here in Beaconsfield and made some <coughs> applications to the Department of Green and Heritage. And there was a lot of paperwork in the, the, the ATI request, which just got back a couple months ago. We haven't had a look at it. This thing is like you know, 900 pages. Uh, it's a relatively small amount of money to create this thing, but it's government. Um, so this is sort of the, the policy government is taking, the conservative government is taking this national capital military commemoration and, and it's sort of pushing it out. And just one other thing, too, in terms of the, the, the things that I think Al you mentioned, I wrote this down, you know, expect to see the values of the nations expressed in your national capital. Absolutely. What are the values of the nation? And this current conservative government believes that the, this capital is built on the values of the Laurentian elite. You've read the book by my friend Bricker and, and whatever. Uh, you know the Montreal, Ottawa, uh, Toronto axis. That this is a capital that expresses the values of the Laurentian elite. And if there's one government that is not going to be dominated whatever by the Laurentian elite, it's this one. And so, if the Laurentian elite hates the victims of communism memorial, then by God, we're doing something right. That is the mindset. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sometimes a little dopey. But that's the way they think. They absolutely think that everybody in Ottawa hates what we're doing. By God, we're on the right track. That's your government in action. I can't ask that. Nadine, you have, uh, you, you know, like, like the other panelists, you didn't have much, uh, we didn't give you much time. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you see it? Because you alluded to it. The relationship between uh, monument to the victims of communism and the Holocaust monument. You... Sure. So um, one thing that I am surprised by, and I, I did allude to this, is that um, in the building of the of the CMHR, uh, one of the major debates was really between uh, two Ukrainian community groups um, uh, regarding this question of, of um, the so-called dominance of Holocaust representation over their own. Their own suffering under the, uh, their own history of suffering under Stalinism. And I find it interesting that you have these two monuments being built here in Canada, uh, sorry, in Ottawa, one to the Holocaust and one to the victims of communism. And uh, there are quite a few actually um, community group, uh, Ukrainian community groups involved with that, as well as Polish and Vietnamese and many other, many other cultural groups across Canada who are involved with the victims of communism monument. And I find it interesting that there's no actual direct dialogue between those two. Uh, forget the fact that there isn't a bigger a bigger dialogue about the Holocaust monument, but between these two, in fact, nobody seems to be speaking to each other. Um, and to transpose that um, onto the European continent, where these things actually happen, there are major debates over there constantly uh, under the context of what is referred to as a victim of comp uh, competition of victimhood. This idea of who suffered more, victims of the Holocaust or victims under communism. And these are these are really important debates going on in Europe. And I find it interesting that the, you know, transposing these 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 monuments that that refer back to those two histories here in Ottawa have not in any way seemed to replicate any of those conversations in a way that they they did westward they did out west in, uh, in Winnipeg. Um, otherwise, uh, more pragmatically, there there are 
important uh, similarities between these two monuments in terms of timeline, in terms of our both projects at the NCC. Um, they're very close to each other in, in, in Ottawa. They will be, you know, there, are, there is definitely some geographic symbolism. They will be speaking to each other in terms of, in the context of the landscape of, of the city. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking and trying to hear some something. Can I ask a question of Hampton? Maybe you can start with me. I think it's about the role of donors, both with the Museum of Human Rights and the uh, two new proposed monuments, and whether they are influencing the debate about like, what is going to be emphasized and emphasized. I mean, I used to work with the Astros, and I know that was their, their project there the Museum of Human Rights. So I don't know if you have any thoughts or thoughts on that. That's a really good, uh, a really good question. I know that one of the, the big points of contention with the Victims of Communism monument is that they're there's so many uh, kind of, there's so many political people standing behind it, like Minister Penny, who is a big champion of this weather. I don't think funds have actually come from like, this ministry, but um, he's helpful probably raising funds and giving people a chance to it. And kind of gives a certain authority to the project as such. Um, more than that, I, I'm not, uh, I don't know how much of an influence uh, donors have actually had, but I, I imagine there, there is Wasn't our election campaign in 2011? They campaigned. But in fact, it's related to the point uh, Mac mentioned before that we don't put money in just waiting for dollars. So in fact, the, the, the impact of the problem of balance can be will be always a problem because mm-hmm. other issue who will raise uh, you know the money for you know, uh, you know social. Original people. But with both monuments, there is a matching, like a matching fund mm-hmm. system in place where the government offers an amount, I think, price of maybe four and a half million or five and a half million, I think, for each one. And then if there was the expectation that the, the donors would raise, like these private contribute to liberty yeah. and I actually forget now the name of the organization under the health office now that I'm in, but also a, a conglomeration of, of private donors uh, that they would match. Well, I think I've been to some dinners where you're talking about the Prime Minister Jason Kenney. These are big, elaborate dinners that are served as political events as well as fundraising events, as well as you know, Dolphin Arrow events, and it's very money sort of things. Having been, uh, having been on the committee that studied the, uh, that studied the, the proposal for this particular monument, uh, I can tell you that they are very, very they were very adamant. Because the committee, yeah, now it's I guess it's, it has become public because Don Butler uh, in the Citizen uh, wrote pieces about uh, about that, and uh, the, the committee was uh, the committee we were unanimously against the not the idea but the particular formulation of the monument. We tried to convince them that it should be larger than that because of total totalitarianism, and uh, but we. I mean, we're just an advisory committee, and uh, so so the board of the National Capital, you know, uh, thought uh, otherwise. They tried to compromise, but in the, in the end, this is the this is the this is the minister that uh, this is the government that it's, it's the same thing for the uh, Commission de historique. You know, we, it's it's a political decision uh, at the end. Je pense qu'on va maintenant passer la parole. Je suis sûr que la, 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 la discussion a été fascinante. Je pense qu'il y a sûrement des questions et des commentaires. Robert. Ah oui, merci, Yves. Tu as fait la remarque au début uh, de ce que ce gouvernement est un des objectifs. Ils veulent devenir le parti national du Canada. C'est le nom de la Commission de l'Université. Je me demande combien de reconnaissance ou de compréhension il y a que ces projets sont. Nous avons parlé de la commémoration, mais je pense que c'est un certain. Hyper-partisan aspect to, to what's been going on. And very specifically, these, 
how much acknowledgement is there that these monuments are, that these projects are very, very targeted, and targeted, but not just in creating a, a new, broad consensus of how Canadians think about their country, but also targeting specific uh, voting groups, voting blocks, and I'm talking about ethnic cultural groups here. You, and it was mentioned that Jason Kenney's been involved in these projects, and he was one of their main guys in winning and stealing the ethnic cultural vote from the Liberals. And if you look at who these projects appeal to, uh, uh, conservative uh, Ukrainians, maybe Jewish uh, uh, voters. These are, are some of the other culture groups that the conservatives have been, have made little secret about, about the fact that they're targeting. Um, do you think there's much understanding about this, or is this something that has been kind of talked, or, talked about or that you've heard of, kind of, you know, maybe uh, in passing that, yeah, this is going to get us the goals that we need with these specific, these specific groups of people? And, and how does that? How does that compare to about that kind of very uh, targeted political activity to the more broad sort of partisanship or political nature of commemoration of the past? I mean, I think you put your finger directly on what I think is, is the big difference in the 21st century commemoration as opposed to the politics of the period. I think they are running election campaigns. Right, I mean, there's sort of that unspoken recognition that, that this is an extension of Keeney's strategy of going after the particular ethnic culture groups. I've heard that expressed many, many, many times. But sort of, look how to say it, you know, it doesn't work its way into any sort of newspapers or, or uh, research articles. But it's sort of that sort of, yeah, we recognize that thing going on, but we don't say that directly. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's hard to the, the 15 minutes prior to the question period was called Member Statements, Standing Order 31, that's the 31. And I, I very much enjoy watching this over the because this is when MPs would stand up and talk for a minute about anything they want. Vladislav Lisan is trying to be reelected in a Pickering area, right? You know, he's a Pickering, somewhere in the GTA. He's from Poland. And uh, he spoke about this on the communism because he lived under it, and anytime he can talk about it, it's great. Mark Adler is trying to get elected in the North Center. Uh, Mark has a, Mark's Jewish. Mark was the one that I was there. He was two feet from him. He was at the Whaley Ball in Jerusalem. And he said, uh, this is the million dollar shot. Oh, yes. Yes. That's Mark Adler. Um, <laughs> you're a nice fellow, but you don't think so. Uh, Mark's Jewish. And so certainly there's a Jewish component. Right? He's got a lot of Russians as well. It's right. They live under communism. Cornelius Chizu, he's definitely Pickering. He's from Romania. Mark has been to Romania. We keep talking about communism, blah, blah, blah. Then we talk about uh, the biggest communist government in the world, China. And now we're talking the whole Pacific Coast narrative. with Paula Swan, our Minister of State for Seniors, and you know, the new rise of the Senior Center. She's up for re-election in the riding of Richmond. Richmond's definitely in play uh, versus the Liberals. And there's a whole lot of ridings in the lower mainland that are in play. So those already, and for the last year, there's a whole lot of members of the conservative benches who have lived and been victims of communism, which are already talking uh, sort of about this. So, um, yes, uh, there's no question about it. But it, again, you know, I, I don't know that you can say this is a conservative only thing. And that's why I, I come back to the debate we had about the Charter of Rights, where all these liberals were standing up and they couldn't understand why on earth you guys can't get it. But the Charter of Rights is like us, because that's what they have talked about it. They have history on that, and that's theirs. And again, the Democrats at this point, you know, I kind of think of you know, particular moments in history besides, of course, that you know, Tommy Douglas and healthcare and all that. And of course, it's, all, it's always, yeah. coverage has always been political. Yeah, yeah but, but it's so, so targeted, it's so focused. But, well, you're absolutely yeah, on so that one. Communism, you know, I just, I gave you those specifics. So yeah, those writings that are all in play, and every writing's going to count as well. But it's also I mean, an international statement. So it's not only for the internal politics, it's also a statement about how, how Canada is behaving on the international scene. You know, when I say for peacekeeping, we don't talk a lot, we don't talk anymore about the peacekeeping stuff, but now it's this kind of monument. And this is for me, it's not only like a policy statement or a policy game, I think it's not my, I mean my comment, but I mean that we, we are so have to think that uh, our government is also playing a game on the international scene about 
the way Canada should be seen or should be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a kind of statement in that sense. Sure. Okay, I guess uh, I agree with what you just said, Alain, because it's, I think it goes beyond political um, advantages at home, because talk about overkill with the size of the thing and the emplacement of it. And I think that goes beyond our borders. I mean, it's bam, you know, this is it, and we're... Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe we talk a little bit of debate about the Holocaust memorial size. And, and, absolutely, and that didn't. Uh, you mentioned the lack of uh, discussion about the whole thing, and somebody, I was talking to somebody recently, and they mentioned the fact that as a population we're growing old, and I think that in terms of, uh, you know, doing something about things, older people tend to be more relaxed and less in your face, and you think that that plays a part in the lack of. Debate not only on that, but I mean on many issues uh, in society now. Uh, but how, how much of it is sort of the nature of Ottawa when uh, we say that NCC is sort of giving its go ahead or maybe not, and uh, the city of Ottawa is protesting with this kind of power? So it's a weird dynamics of Ottawa and the federal government within Ottawa. Is it, would we see the same? Well, there was recently last week, wasn't it? The, I'm going to confuse the parties here, but uh, wasn't the, the local politicians of Ottawa, wasn't there a vote against? They tried to. Yeah. They tried to. Yeah. yeah. The city council. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Jim Watson has spoken out. Okay. Jim Watson has spoken out very directly against the monument, but I'm not sure what effect that actually will have. So I just, I just don't know how that affects the. There might be what followed. I'm just trying to think. In the early days of the Harvard government, there was, this, there was some debate about a, uh, a Canadian portrait gallery. Um, and a lot of people, uh, you know, we shut down the photograph of the Canadian National Guard photograph of the uh, Museum Gallery of Heaven. Um, and there was discussion to put it in Calgary. And uh, a lot of people had a discussion with Block of Block Heads about the Capitol. You put your national museums in the Capitol. You don't put one in Calgary and one in. Um, and, and you know, knowing the way, just the way some conservatives think is the pushback they're getting on this is memorial. Uh, there, it, you know, may not be built if they don't form government in a few months. It won't be too late. Somebody can change your mind. Uh, but if the conservatives are in, uh, you can see them saying, you know, yeah, just to show Ottawa, we're going to put the portrait gallery in Calgary, or you know, that's that's the sort of thing they do. I mean, they're quite the, the conservatives uh, are quite willing to just. Shake it up, just for fun, spite, and sometimes they have a good reason behind it. Um, the Democrats as well are also, I think, you know, ready to look at uh, different ideas and different ways to mark our uh, patrimony as well. Uh, it may not be so mean spirited or vicious or so overtly political, but it will be because they want to do something different than the liberals, which is both uh, those parties are quite keen to do something, anything different than uh, you know, Priscillian liberals. Uh, to add about, uh, I think the relationship between cap the capital organization form of government and the city is not always an easy one. And even here in Ottawa, you know, uh, a year ago there was a big fight between the 
not only the main Jim Watson, but also Edson Mayer with, uh, with NCC about different things. The one was about the floating of the street on the north side, of the Latino tide. There was the question of the transit way, etc. So, and this wasn't an easy because uh, the idea of the capital is like something more symbolic, and then there was a vision of themselves against the, the citizen. Uh, this is not always the case uh, in every city, but there's often this kind of, uh, of fight. For example, but an another example is the big city, which has also the national country. And all, all there, all, all there were also some issues about, you know, uh, uh, about buildings and commemorations, etc. So the same issue arose. And, uh, and uh, one example of uh, social, there was an example, a clear example of political issue with commemoration there. There was in uh, 1918 the, the Easter uh, uh, massacre. In fact, uh, four people were killed in the, in the, by the army. And there was a big fight for, to have a monument about it. And it was a, a, a long story. Citizens paid for it. And this was like something it took time for the citizen community to get the monument. Uh, uh, well, well. When, did, well, when was this debate? Right after, right after the event? What we done is that ah, we, in ah, the okay. 19th, I the monument, was, this monument was uh, unveiled uh, in the 90s and it took eight, 10 years maybe to get the money. Mm -hmm. to build the Dernière question, Marcel, Robert. Uh, I have two questions, two different questions. Uh, I've lived in Trump, in Ottawa, you know, between 1919 and 1998, and at the time we did not have many monuments. I'm surprised that now we have seven nine monuments. <coughs> First question, where are all those monuments? Are we running out of uh, space? And if we are running out of space, are we invading other parts of the city that have not been invaded? Second question, every time we talk about Ottawa, we forget about something. And I like, uh, uh, Alan, what you said, you know, there is a city, but there is also a capital. And unless I'm mistaken, since the 60s, you know, the federal government has tried to integrate the hall. To what extent hall, which is not getting it, has been integrated in the development of the capital. In other words, how many monuments do we have on the other side of the river? I know the one uh, Maurice Richard, but besides that one, how many more monuments? Then all those monuments, where are they? Are we running out of space? And what are we doing with Hall? Is Hall part of developing you know, capital? We're not, first, I reassure you, we're not running out of space. In, the 80, in 88, the report... And we can have a monument to the victims of Stephen Harper? I think... <laughs> that, uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in 1966, in fact, it was the first plan for the for the, for the hill. We planned like 20 more, so was 25 more monuments just on the problem of the hill. So, uh, yes. And they said the, all the monuments, so all these most places are still, most of them are still empty. Oh. But they feel some, you know, with uh, monument, and, but uh, and there are a few in uh, in uh, in uh, so I have a list with here. But one of the oldest one is uh, one to, for example, you have one Champlain, is the Champlain, and then you have a few over some of the this is true. There are no more than ten of them for that. The Maurice Richard, the Parlement du Québec, or the Parlement Canadien. Maurice Richard, actually, is the most important. Ah, okay. <rire> <rire> Maurice Richard, de toute façon, est un, un héros canadien français dans, dans ce qu'il a de plus canadien français depuis le Par exemple, tu n'as pas dans cette liste-là le monument, pas de bien, mais non, c'est un, enfin, il est sûr dans le Val Pétro, c'est un missionnaire, le 18, qui est un monument des années 20, en fait, il y en a plusieurs comme ça qui sont... Nowadays, there is, I don't, I don't remember exactly what, what are the categories, but there are three categories, one is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the National Commission, let's say that you you want to commemorate your grandfather, uh, you know, the, the National Commission will determine if it's uh, if it's a national, it should be a national commemoration, then there are some spaces in the city, and there are 
three categories, and sometimes it, there is a contention there with, of course, the promoters always think that their cause is the, the most worthwhile. Yeah. 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 C'est la liste qui a été en partie fournie par la CCM, plus euh, une recherche en fait dans, à la fois dans les, les, les listes de monuments de la ville de Gatineau, qui en a déjà une dizaine de nommés, plus d'autres. Donc, il y a encore de la place. Et <rire> beaucoup de monuments. La classe, très I think that uh, if I remember this, what happened to this one, first of all, the first proposal, we, we sent it back because it was the rationale for it, l'argumentaire, uh, left much to be desired. So they went back and maybe they talked to you, I don't know, but they had to other labor historians and then they came back with a better, uh, with a much better uh, proposal. But then there is the question, well, I remember there was an issue about the money, and then it gets into the bureaucracy and it takes a, a lot of time because uh, I, I don't remember exactly how it works, but they have, it's not only that they have to build the monument, they have also to, to, to get to, to bring some money or to engage some money that they will contribute to the maintenance of was a long process. Certainly, it's going to have the, the same backup as for, oh, there are two monuments. 2017, right? So, I mean, I, I, you may, I mean, one of you may know more about this. I mean, and the work that also came, contains political language, that this will be about all the buildings for these people who helped create the I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, can you tell us more about all those monuments? You know what, that, in fact, you're doing some reading about this today. That would be a great list to compile. I, I only know of two, and I'm sure there's many, many more uh, quite across the country. So that's something I hope to do some work on. Uh, talk about, write about, etc. So just to answer your question about the, the theme, um, in, uh, nine, in 2007, uh, 61 months, and they used the uh, Parks Canada's framework to 73% are related to policy life, political, and to cultural life, 21% to social life, and 1.6% to economic way to do the economy. So even if there's one out of there, you know, this this is still the frame is still uh, at the same. And even more, I think most of the more recent uh, monuments are more on the political yeah. uh, uh, side or theme than uh, and what has happened I, in the, when the, the, now the committee still exists, but it's another committee and we have, we have not been called for a while. And in a way, it doesn't, it's not the National Capital Commission that is responsible now for public public programmation. It's it's under the Ministry of, uh, of Heritage. And uh, the, they don't respect, for instance, for instance, the, the problem with the, the victims of communism is that one of the criteria it, that it has involved Canadians at the time, or that it is on Canadian soil. For the victims of uh, communism, it doesn't uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't apply. And another criteria is the war, the the one on Afghanistan. There's supposed to be I don't maybe you know Alain, I don't remember the exact number of years, but there should be a number of years before uh, a monument before the event has happened before it would be uh, mm -hmm. a monument. So. This criteria has been uh, out of the, this, the window. Too. This was the, the, the most famous, until now, the most famous exception, but it's not contentious at all. It's Oscar Pearson. Well, actually, the, the National War Memorial was altered last year just before the Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. It used to say, if you know, well, it says 39 to 45 and 14 to 11, and it's just added on 2001 to 2011, mm -hmm. Afghanistan and the Korean War. And that created a huge stink 
uh, with the Legion was upset because it's too close mm-hmm. uh, for Afghanistan to show up on the national level. And yeah, just the last one, that's what killing people like being Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah.